Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. So a while back, uh, for my book, Your Creative Peace, Find and Deepen Your Creative Voice While Communing with God, I interviewed Valerie Weller of the business Twig to Nest Studio, and I asked her some creativity questions and how her creative life has worked over the years. So here's what she said. Her creative influences are Almighty God, many beautiful art friends, plants, leaves, organic forms in nature, graphic designs, and anything French. When I think of my favorite artistes, I find I have a lot of eclectic people on my playlist. From Cezanne, Sorola, Sarjan, Degas, Bonar, Michelle Dunaway, Jeremy Lipkin, Madeline Fitzer, Kelly Way Roberts, Flora Bowley, Hans Hoffman, Jillian Gussman. I could go on and on. My top three mediums of creativity are watercolor, watercolor, oil, and mixed media. Or, as I think of it, mixed up media. Because I tend to use all of these in different combinations with acrylic, paper, and decoupage. Lately, I've been juggling between decoupage on on glass and wood for my work while exploring mixed media, but watercolor and oil always make my heart skip a beat. She says, I grew up in the suburbs of New York, Long Island, where there were no fences and children played hide-and-seek until the sun went down. I love being creative, making things, playing with all kinds of art supplies. After completing a BA degree with a major in art and a minor in education, I find myself found myself starting off as a substitute teacher in the schools, worked my way through a couple of small graphic design companies, and then made my way to the Los Angeles area. I met my sweet dear husband there, and what was to be a temporary move became a place to call home where I raised two kids developed a core group of dear friends that we call family. Working in my business as a freelance graphic designer for over 20 years, taking various art classes, plein air, figurative, drawing, watercolor, playing tennis and working at various ministries to church have kept my artistic wings flying. I think the most creative endeavor in life so far has been building relationships, God, family, and friendships. What is one of your earliest creative memories? My earliest creative memory was that wonderful box of 64 Crayola crayons. I remember feeling as if I died and went to heaven when I received that box of crayons. I remember looking at all the colors, not just blue, red, and yellow, but periwinkle, salmon, sea green, carnation pink, cornflower blue. The smell of those colors, that nifty sharpener, and the beginning of endless possibilities in color. How did you find your creative voice? I remember always doing creative things from making paper cutouts, sewing my Barbie clothes, making shoebox houses for my dolls, sewing my old clothes in high school, and painting on canvas from photos. In retrospect, I think my creative voice really started to scream out in high school. I was blessed to be in a school district that had an art department with a printmaking class, a photo lab, a portfolio class, drawing, painting, a place where teachers took us to NYC to museums and our group met on the weekends to discuss art history. The exposure to this kind of program in high school opened up a vision that made me feel that being an artist was possible. Although I've worked as a graphic designer most of my life, the painter in me has been quietly emerging. I've always been working on that voice. I may know it, I may know it is present, but it's slowly becoming less fearful and willing to show itself in a bit louder way than it used to. Did your creative habits make a smooth transition into your adult life, and what did the evolution look like? 
I think the creative habits that God gifted me with were a constant since I was young. I guess high school may have been the transitional point in believing, into believing that I had a valued creative ability. I do see that my parents nurtured those gifts in me big time through the years. They encouraged my artistic expression, my artsy independence, my artistic paths. They provided me with a college education where I majored in art and minored in education, all of which were the seeds that brought me to this artistic path that I'm on now. I don't remember a time where I wasn't taking a class or exploring another artistic expression. I did creative projects with my children through the years, participated in the schools as an art teacher, room mom, creative project coordinator. I guess I've always been artsy even when I wasn't thinking about it. Just a little inside story, my transition from New York to LA. Having been raised with an independent spirit, I decided after my first ever plane trip to Los Angeles, I came out to visit my dear New York friends that were getting going to medical school here to move out here for a couple years. I visited for a week, went back to New York, told my parents I wanted to move to LA, sold my stuff, bought a ticket, moved out here, got a job in three weeks, got an apartment in six weeks, bought a little truck with a stick shift, which I didn't know how to drive, and met my husband through the graphic design job. Within two months, found out he lived around the corner. And, well, the rest is history. All I know is that every part of my journey, every friend I've had, every part of this creative life has the thumb pit print of a bigger plan on it. How has God been a part of your creative process and lifestyle? When I think about it, God's Spirit was putting the pieces together from the beginning, but I didn't really begin to see until I was in my 30s. I had a religious upbringing, which I know gave me a foundation and core belief system, but it wasn't until I was in my 30s that I began to know true belief and understand the depth of what God had done for me. Wow, did that impact my artistic process. From that point on, every brush stroke had a purpose. Every creative expression had a depth to it that I hadn't known before. And more impor importantly, I began to learn that this gift of creativity was given to be shared with others, to lift others, to show God's expression. And from that came the ultimate joy in the creative work that I am doing. Is there a particular moment where your creativity began, became infused into a spiritual practice? Actually, about 10 years ago, I had the pleasure of doing freelance graphic design projects for the church I attended at the time. Working with a believing group of creative people taught me more about purpose, prayer, and the gift of creating. And boy, was that a fun time of life. My most fulfilling graphic work happened then. Today, I'm blessed to be part of a fabulous ministry that feeds the homeless. Before the meal is served, the children of the families come to my art table and do an art project. God has been true in providing for this ministry with creativity, supplies, and spirit. I experience pure joy with these kids and receive so much back compared to what I feel I am giving. Is there one particular thing that you do that ushers you into a place of worship? Whenever I pick up a paintbrush and start to get absorbed in a painting, it becomes a spiritual experience for me, an overwhelming peace that is ever present. Even when I am struggling through and don't like what I'm doing, which is most often, I know that I am in a growing process and something good will come. I am ever mindful when I am painting of where the gift comes from, and it brings me to that place of worship. My favorite quote is by Robert Henry. The object isn't to make art. It is to be in that wonderful state which makes art inevitable. Another favorite quote by Camille Passaro. Blessed are they who see beautiful things in humble places where other people see nothing. And finally, by John Singer Sargent, to work is to pray. Daniel Laporte in her book, White Hot Truth, says, Part of being a grown-up, a relative term, 
is knowing what's good for you. As we experiment with ideas, programs, and substances, we're fine-tuning out our what works detectors. Gestalt theory rocked your world for a few years, but now you're just so done with talking about it. Bible study, hot yoga, flower essences, Rasta, shamanic drum journeying. Some explorations turn into lifelong practices. Others we naturally outgrow, and sometimes, especially if we've been forcing our interests just to be cool, we wake up and wonder, what was I thinking? I was sitting in a weekend Buddhist retreat at a theology school. A few yoga mats to the left of me sat a dude wearing purple drop crotch cotton pants and, of course, a tie-dye t-shirt and moccasins. He was in the throes of an intellectual fest with the Lama in charge about why the sky is blue. Not scientifically why the sky is blue, but why, as humans, we all agree to collectively perceive that the sky is blue. The basic gist, our deep consciousness resonates with the moving molecules of the sensory world, and I didn't even come close to caring about this intellectual abstraction like I so don't care because... Because that particular weekend, I was thinking, I'm having a really shitty session. And this information is not going to help me at all. Can we please talk about how I explain pornography to my kid in the context of Buddha, right actions? And how do I transcend my ego as my public profile rises? And more to the point of my currently very raw heart, can we please talk about the karma of revenge that seems, you know, justified? Because my ex my ex just accidentally sent me a very special text that was intended for his new girlfriend, and I'm thinking of bashing in his headlights on my way home tonight. But hey, go ahead and blather about the sky being blue. I'm sure it's applicable for somebody with no worries or cares in the sentient world, or someone in this room wearing purple drop crotch cotton pants and moccasins. Not useful not useful at all. I need a truth that I can work with. I want spirituality that I can apply in my everyday, ambitious, very private, somewhat public, sweet little, big, messy, gorgeous, desirous, meaningful, normal existence. I need a presence that makes my entire life, takes my entire life into consideration. Write what you know, cross that out, write what you like. This is from the book, Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. The movie Jurassic Park came out on my 10th birthday. I loved it. The minute I left the theater, I was dying for a sequel. So I sat down the next day at my old PC and typed it out. In my treatment, the son of the game warden eaten by the velociraptors goes back to the island with the granddaughter of the guy who built the truck. One of them wants to destroy the rest of the park. The other wants to save it. Of course, they fall in love and adventure ensues. I didn't know it at the time, but I was writing what we now call fan fiction. Fictional stories based on characters that already exist. Ten-year-old me saved the story to the hard drive. A few years later, Jurassic Park 2 finally came out, and it sucked. The sequel always sucks compared to the sequel in our heads. The question every young writer at some point asks is, what should I write? And the standard answer is, write what you know. The advice always leads to terrible stories in which nothing interesting happens. Brian Eno says, My interest in making music has been to create something that does not exist that I would like to listen to. I wanted to hear music that had not yet happened by putting together things that, ha that suggested a new thing which did not yet exist. We make art because we like art. We're drawn to certain kinds of work because we're inspired by people doing that work. All fiction is, in fact, fan fiction. The best advice is not to write what you know. 
it's to write what you like. Write the kind of story you like best. Write the story you want to read. The same principle applies to your life and to your career. Whenever you're at a loss for what move to make next, just ask yourself, what would make a better story? Bradford Fo uh, Cox, the member of the band Deer Hunter, says that when he was a kid, he didn't have the internet, so he had to wait until the official release day to hear his favorite band's new album. He had a game he would play. He would sit down and record a fake version of what he wanted the new albums to sound like. Then, when the album came out, he would compare the songs he'd written with the songs on the real album. And what do you know, many of these songs eventually became Deer Hunter songs. When we love a piece of work, we're desperate for more. We crave sequels. Why not channel that desire into something productive? Think about your favorite work and your creative heroes. What did they miss? What didn't they make? What could have been better? If they were still alive, what would they be making today? If all your favorite makers got together and collaborated, what would they make with you, with you leading the crew? Go make that stuff. The manifesto is this. Draw the art you want to see. Start the business you want to run. Play the music you want to hear. Write the books you want to read. Build the products you want to use. Do the work you want to see done. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. If you want to find anything else about me, what I do in the world, it's all listed on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. Mm -hmm.